Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting, jam-packed, amazing technical episode of the Clinic Gym Radio. I'm your host, Dr. Josh Satterley, and I'm here with one of my service industry heroes, the amazing Jim Hacking from St. Louis, Missouri. And uh, Jim, how are you today? I'm doing great, Dr. Josh. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Now, for those listening who don't know Jim Hacking, which I can't imagine that's the case, but let's just give him a little credit here. It's a little grace. Jim is an a incredible immigration attorney based in St. Louis um, and also the host of the Maximum Lawyer podcast and Maximum Lawyer Facebook group, which is basically, as I understand it, Jim, a Facebook group where lawyers can go to talk about all the business stuff about being a lawyer, not necessarily the law part, but how do you run a business, make a little bit of money, you know, keep your team happy, all the things that kind of affect small business owners. That's right. And that, that Facebook group has grown to about 3,400 law firm owners. So it's really sort of crazy the way that it's taken off. Um, it's a great resource for people. It's also a great resource for me. If I have a question about a piece of software or about an approach to things, I just posted on, like the other day, my wife was trying to figure out, we don't really have a vacation policy uh, per se, and we wanted to formalize it. So I just said, hey, everybody, what's your vacation policy? Do you treat attorneys different than the rest of the staff? And just within six hours, there were probably 30 responses with different approaches and different ideas. That's awesome. Now, I'm sure people are wondering why the heck do you have an attorney on, especially an immigration attorney? And here's what I've learned. I somehow stumbled into your group. I think it was through our, few, our mutual friend, Kelsey Bratcher. And Kelsey is a master of marketing automation, tech, integrating programs to get them to talk to each other. And I think I found your group. And what struck me is, you know, most of the people listening here are chiropractors, some physical therapists, some strength coaches. But in the end, all service-based businesses, right? One-on-one -on -one service, just like you, when you're working with clients, is basically a one-on-one -on -one service. And what struck me is that everybody in your group was striving to reduce the load of paperwork, reduce the load of all these policies and, and things that have to get done to get paid for our case, you know, for our work. And I, I was really sitting there thinking, oh my gosh, my profession doesn't have a group like this, at least not that I found. And I'm going to sit in the bleachers and, you know, gain all this knowledge about how to run an efficient office. Now, since I'm me and I can't help myself, I had to comment 84,000 times, but you know, like it was, I was impressed with that. So when you started that group, did you think that's what it would be a lot of, or kind of what'd you start out thinking? Well, so this Saturday will be the four-year anniversary of the podcast. So we haven't missed a week. So for the last 208 weeks, we've dropped at least one episode of the podcast. And the podcast is called Maximum Lawyer. And we thought it up because we were having these great conversations about uh, business automation and about marketing. And I said to Tyson, I said, there aren't very many podcasts for small firm solo lawyers who want to improve. And we debated really, Josh, at the beginning, like, do we focus on people who already get it? Mm -hmm. Or do we go and try to convince people that the way that we think about automation or marketing is the way to go? And luckily for us, we decided not to get in the convincing business. We just made it more of a mission of finding people who are doing interesting things. So if you listen to the old episodes, the first 12 or 15 are just Tyson and I. Yep. And then we, then we just started finding attorney friends of ours who were doing cool things. And it was sort of fun. We, we interviewed a guy named Will Eady, who's a nursing home lawyer in uh, Cleveland. And you might say to yourself, well, what does a nursing home lawyer in Cleveland have to teach an immigration lawyer in St. Louis? But just as you said, we're all in the service industry. So we had Will on the show. And he introduced us to a bunch of his friends in Cleveland. And then we had this little cult following in Cleveland. Then the same thing happened in Atlanta and then in New Jersey. And so it's really grown organically. Now the Facebook group is sort of its own independent things. There's people in the Facebook group that when you mention the podcast, they're like, what's that? Like they don't even know about, it. some of them don't even know that it's like Tyson and I, they just think it's a place for lawyers to hang out. So I really encourage you and your listeners to think about that in a collaborative way. And I think that, you know, we, it's a, it's a group that very luckily operates from a growth mindset as opposed to a closed mindset. If you haven't read that book um, by Dr. Exactly. Duckworth. Yeah, it's a great book. Um, I highly recommend it. And I think that Dan Kennedy would say that if you're, if you own a chiropractic gym, a chiropractic office in a gym, 
and you're marketing just like everybody else, then you're going to get stumped. You have to stand out. You have to do things differently. And if I'm a chiropractor who owns a gym, I think I have all kinds of content that that just gets my mind moving. Like right now I can just picture, you know, videos or, you know, downloadable reports or, you know, just videos answering questions. You know, I love to do that or just showing exercises or showing stretches. Like I got a massage today and my gastric muscles are like tight as can be because I've been walking so much during COVID and just any stretches that you could show me that would help with that, I think would be something that you can develop a following. That's awesome. Well, I want to dive into a little bit of the how and uh, uh, hopefully we'll illustrate this with some stories along the way. So uh, you're talking about video and I, I know this about you, but um, you know, you operate in a, so you're an immigration attorney. So let's say 90% of the nation doesn't need your services, may never need your services and probably has never opened the phone book and looked for an immigration attorney, right? Right. So essentially you have a niche of the population that uh, you don't have anybody that's mildly interested in your services, right? Like, ah, that'd be nice, kind of, it's either, uh, it's a light switch, it's either on or off, right? And so I started doing some videos long ago, and as in the in one thing you're great at is just slicing off little bits and little bits and little bits. So uh, can you tell me the first time that like you knew that those videos were making an impact? I mean, because yeah. for a while, I'm sure it just feels like you're peeing in the ocean, right? Like you're doing all this content and it quote unquote isn't working. It's great that we're talking about this right now, Josh. Um, when, when I started doing the videos, it was seven years ago. And the first time I did videos, I paid $8,000 and flew to Virginia to create 16 videos. If you look on my YouTube channel, they are almost the least watched videos that I have. After that, I just started- now, Hold on real quick, just so people can put this in perspective. Uh, at the time, uh, and now you're an incredibly well-paid, uh, you know, highly sought after immigration attorney that probably has 8,000 bucks in the, in the, in the dryer vent, right? Like just gets caught huh. up in the, in the lint trap. But at the time, was that 8,000, like you looking at your wife, wondering if she was going to leave you for suggesting this idea? Yeah. I, well, I didn't tell her, but, um, I think, <laughs> that's even better. I think that back then my annual revenue was probably around 80 grand. So I you know that's 10% of what I did. So, yeah. um, but I believed in it. But, you know, my, one of my marketing gurus that you and I have talked about a lot is Dean Jackson. And he says that he really wishes that whenever someone decides to start creating content for marketing purposes, that they were prohibited from looking at their numbers for at least one year. And I think that's really good advice. So um, luckily for me, about a year and a half into it, I got, I got this crazy idea. I, I heard a story about Jerry Seinfeld and somebody asked him, Jerry, how do you have so many jokes at your disposal? And he says, what I do is I buy this desk calendar. And at the start of the year, I rip off January and I post it on the wall. And on January 1st, I write one joke. And then I take a big red marker and I put an X through January 1st. And then I do it again on January 2nd. And my job then becomes to just not break that chain. And so for me, about a year and a half into it, I started, I did a hundred videos in a hundred days and that helped create the momentum for the, um, for the channel. Now you asked me, when did I realize it worked? So I thought video would be a lead generation system, but it's not. The, the great thing about video is it's a lead conversion system. So People find my YouTube channel lots of different ways. Of course, YouTube is the second biggest search engine and it's part of Google. So when you, if you do your content right and you're answering questions that people type into the search bar about immigration or about chiropractic, into the search bar, if you're answering those popular questions, then your videos are going to start coming up. But I knew that I was on to something when I walked into a conference room one time and your listeners aren't going to be able to see us, but you will be able to, Josh. I walked into the conference room and this guy jumped up and he goes, Mr. Jim. And he shook my hand like I was a movie star. And he had, he had driven from Topeka, Wichita, Kansas. So he had driven by all the immigration lawyers in Kansas city and all the immigration lawyers in St. Louis to get to me 
to help him with his deportation. And I didn't have to do any selling. I didn't have to convince him of anything. He said, I've watched all your videos, right? Wow. Even the ones not about deportation. He goes, and I'm convinced that you're the attorney for me. I now have that conversation four or five times a week because the channel has just gone berserk. And the reason that we, we have doubled, we've gone from 9,000 subscribers to 20,000 subscribers in 2020 because we're doing one video every day. Wow. That's impressive. I think I need to bring this to my group. So let me do it. Let me just to quell those thoughts. Some of you are going, Oh, a hundred videos in a hundred days. I don't have a hundred things to talk about. Right? Like now, is each one of these videos a 19 part dissection of the immigration laws and how to combat them piece by piece? Like what are the subjects of these videos? Like for people out there, sometimes there's this overwhelm of, I have to prepare so much and I've seen it in your group. Oh, I, I want to start doing videos next month. I right. just need to take this time to get ready or study up or do these things. And the response from you and everybody that's ever done a hundred video, a hundred day challenge is start right now pull out your phone, hit record. And basically it's like, that, like shut up and move weights. I remember my high school uh, football coach, we'd ask, Hey, what's the best way to get strong? Shut up and move weights. Okay, coach. But I, I want to understand, like, should I do more squats and shut up and move the weight? Like at some point, like, so you're saying I should shut my mouth and actually go lift. And it's like, I'm yeah. telling you, that's going to be probably the most effective method. Right. So I would think, that anybody who's been a practicing chiropractor for at least one year mm -hmm. has answered the same questions over and over. Mm -hmm. So right off the bat, you should be able to come up with the 20 most common chiropractic questions. And they might be something like, does health insurance cover all of it? Does it only cover part of it? Or well, what do I do if I twist my ankle? Or what do I do if I can't get an adjustment for a week and a half? You know, whatever it is. So my questions are very basic. My videos are only three minutes long and I have an intro, like I'll do, I'll do one like, uh, all right, what do I do if my wife is trying to get me deported? Hi, I'm Jim Hacking, immigration lawyer, practicing law throughout the United States at our office here in St. Louis, Missouri. And then at the end, I always end with, if you have questions about your psycho wife, give us a call at 314-961-8200, or you can email us, you can join us in our Facebook group, or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. So if you get those intros and outros in your head, and I never, I, my son is starting to edit my videos, and he's like, Dad, you don't do cuts. I don't do cuts. If I make a mistake, I'm glad. I, 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 unless it's crazy a, mistake, a crazy mistake, or I've misstated the law, I just keep going. And I'll, I'll, I'll say, oh, crap, or I'll say, oh, man, or I might, like, I might sneeze or I just keep going because if it's too polished, people don't like it. Right. So which you happened know, with your first eight videos for yeah, or 16 right. videos for $8,000. Right. You can't, but you can't BS your way through a hundred videos. Your, your, mm -hmm. your voice is going to come through. Your approach is going to come through. Mm -hmm. Your heart is going to come through and people are going to know you. And you're right. 90, I would say 50% of people would never need me. 40% of the people hate what I do and the other 10% love me because like you said, I take a position and I, and I'm sort of forceful with it and I know why I'm doing it. But the mm -hmm. questions themselves, the videos themselves, I just keep a notebook and I'm in a consult. Now people really like it. If I'm in a consult and somebody will say, ask me a question, I'll be, boy, that's a really good question. I should do a video about that. And they get all excited because now their question is going to be in a video, right? But people email me questions, the Facebook group, we get questions. Like what, questions what, if you were to write, you know, if you were to shoot a video tomorrow, what's a common question you get in immigration law? Uh, what do I do if my work authorization card expires? Okay. So, I mean, and, and the amount of thought that that takes up in your mind or, you know, any of your uh, team's mind is about two brain cells worth of information, right? But yeah, I don't go off and do independent research very often. Every now and then I will, yeah. if I want to make sure I get it exactly right. But I hardly ever give, have to but, do extra work. But to the other person, you have to realize like there's a lot of pressure around that question, right? Like they're really worried, just like you're worried about the tight gastroc muscles in your leg. Like, what does this mean? And does this mean I, you know, always have pain? It, it's like, slow down. Like to me, that's a simple solution, but that's what the video should be, right? Yeah. And those SEO companies, you know, they'll, they'll try to sell you, I'll get you the number one chiropractor in Las Vegas on, on the Google three pack, but people aren't typing in who is the best chiropractor. They might, they might type in best chiropractor in Las Vegas, but I'm a big believer in long tail search and long tail search is 
content that brings them, you know, it's, it's not going to have a high volume, but the people who are looking for that question are very, very interested in it. Yeah. That's awesome. I, uh, to tell you about a uh, long tail search, I owned this old Jeep one time, or a, it's actually a international harvester scout, which was like made have been the late seventies. Right. And I was searching for a certain one and I had one that was a certain model that had a certain engine. And so I was typing in, how do you change the crank bolt on scout two, 345 with four barrel and what popped up in the Google selection was, but not the effing two barrel, like, <laughs> which I was like, like oh, this question has been asked pill. multiple times that the algorithm's recognizing it, you know, and I was like, oh, okay, well, that's a perfect way to ask that question, you know, because when you try to solve that problem 18 times, you're cussing at your computer. Anyways, here's where I want to move on, Jim. I know that you did these, all these videos, you're incredible, and it worked which is awesome, right? It started filling your office with, with more and more people needing your services, which I think happens to a lot of service providers. Hey, you find a way to market, you, you're making some, some moves, you're making some penetration, you find the right ad that works or anything, and then it starts working. And with all service businesses, this is, uh, once you get over the starvation of the early days, you move into indigestion, right? Like you move into the, there's too much work, too much follow-up, too much callbacks, and too many questions and your staff is overwhelmed. What was the first time that you were like, man, we might need to build a system here and not just operate this as, as good guy Jim with his notebooks. Well, luckily I hired an assistant right out of the box and she's been with me since August of 2007. Okay. And she's grown with me. She now runs the firm. And so I've been, I, this might be my inherent laziness or just me never wanting to do the same thing over and over and over. I'm a huge believer in doing that, which only you can do and leaving the other stuff to everybody else. So I believe that most service providers are understaffed and that the, the person is running the firm and their, or their, or the practice and they're doing way too much and much of the stuff that they're doing, they don't need to be doing. They should find a, a, a a VA or an assistant to do those things so that they can do the big picture stuff, the growth of the firm, the growth of the practice, bringing in more clients, scaling. Yeah. All right. So in your practice, what was it? Like, what was the first thing where you're like, we got to solve this. This is, this is pissing me off. Um, Cause if I look at like the discussions in the group, it's, it's awesome. You have Paul, his last name starts with why I can't remember it, but it's, um, but he's incredible about putting the, together the system so that when a client enters their information, it's great. He captures it with a form and then pipes that to 18 different locations, right? So you never have, he, what I hate in my own practice in healthcare is I don't, you go to a doctor's office, you write your name, address, and, and a phone number on the top of every sheet times 14. And you're like, come on, we really can't condense this down to one sheet with, or at least pres like, please merge in my, my name email and address because I gave it to you when I booked and I've given it to your front desk app and I filled it out again. And it's like the customer experience sucks. And I'm like, can't we reduce this amount of paperwork? It's all those damn attorneys, Jim, that, you know, make us have all this paperwork. But that's one area when Paul was talking about that, I was like, that's genius because the name is spelled correctly every time. And no matter where it goes to the same place, all because he just spent an extra 10 minutes to build a, a Zapier integration. Um, Anyways, going back, what was it in your firm that was like the first process that you were, let's fix this, let's tune this up? So for me, it was, well, there's a lot of paperwork in immigration and we wanted to have a central data place to capture that and then have it propagate into the forms. We didn't want to have to be doing all these forms. So for, for perspective, was, like on, when you take on a client, if you help them with immigration, how many guesstimate on how many pages of information need to be filled out? So our intake form has probably about, 12 pages, it depends on the case type, but for a typical case, 12 pages with lots of data, um, recording it once is a huge step forward. Um, you know, our mutual friend, Kelsey, he mm -hmm. hates double data entry. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had an experience, I haven't been to a chiropractor in a while, but I do have braces. I've recently got braces at the age of 49. And um, my uh, orthodontist, he's eliminated all those clipboard paperwork things. Those are the worst. And so, 
when I when I went to see him the first, I mean, it was it was a very Dan Kennedy, very scripted experience. You come in, they know your name before you get there. They look up from their computer, they give you an iPad, you fill out some other little forms. Um, not anything that they have, like you said, not anything that they've asked you about before. Awesome. And then, um, and then you get a tour of the office, and then you have a person who's not the orthodontist do like an evaluation, does all the pictures of everything of your mouth. And then she does a little bit of a sales presentation about like, do you want to get Invisalign? Do you want actual braces? Then the dentist comes in, you sit in the chair. So you only see the orthodontist for five minutes, but you feel like you're spending, t- you're there for an hour and it's a part, part, partial assessment, partial sales job, but it's all seamless and it's all thought out. That's really what I think I would encourage your people to think about is, you know, how do I script this out? How do I make the experience mm-hmm. as painless on the on the people as possible? So what are some things you learned about that in immigration law? Because for us, you know, people are in pain. Like they're, they're a lot of times coming in, they're limping or they don't want to move. And, it's, and there's a lot of uh, dealing with the anxiety of that actual painful condition. Whereas in your thing, a lot of times they're under legal pressure, right? They, they, they're worried about the world crashing in and they literally will shift off to another country within days, weeks, or months. So there is that anxiety. What have you learned when you're putting together this experience? Because orthodontia is an elective, right? You could have done it. You didn't have to. It's totally elective. There's not that angst about, you know, what, what will people think of me at 50 if I don't get braces today? Like, probably the same thing they thought of me for all their days. Like, <laughs> not too bad. So... I had the realization that you and I are in the same business and it's not chiropractic and it's not uh, immigration law. We're in the same business as Federal Express. We are a logistics company. We are delivering someone or Southwest. We're delivering someone from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. You're delivering them from a point of pain to a point of health. Mm -hmm. I'm delivering someone from having a work visa to having a green card or from having a green card to um, citizenship or, facing deportation to having a green card. So if you think about it in that respect, then it's all about how do I think up the steps to make the experience smoother and easier and less prone to error. And so what we've really done is spend a lot of time um, thinking, I mean, and I'm talking a lot of time thinking through. I sat down and to get someone a green card, we looked at it and it's 86 steps to get someone a green card. Mm. And, <clears throat> and having that knowledge is important because when we meet with potential clients, our biggest competitor is them thinking they can do it themselves. For you, I guess it would be that they don't really need it, right? So when you tell someone it's an 86 step process and we've done it 400 times, we learn a thing or two doing it 400 times. And so, you know, we, we have this department in our firm called the fix it team. And so whenever a mistake gets made on a case or in, in the handling of a case, it always goes back to the fix it team to go back and look at our systems to see if we um, can improve the systems to um, squeeze that error or that potential for error out of the system. All right. So I know that uh, you met Kelsey, if I remember, because along the way building systems specifically on the marketing side, And I think this is interesting, Jim. Currently, my belief is that good practices have a marketing automation side, but the really excellent businesses have an internal process automation. Like, and that's what really gets them to that next level. Like you can do pretty good with if you automate your marketing, but you can do a hell of a lot better if you automate your internal processes and really tweak them down and get all the little, like all you're saying, your fix it team, all the little tweaks and knobs and a text message here and a Slack alert there. And man, this, should, this really shouldn't be on an email. This should be mailed to their house or, you know, regular updates. Uh, that's what I've been observing for the last year. A lot of that is coming from the Maximum Lawyer group because you guys are impressive. Um, but anyway, so let's go back to when you started with Infusionsoft, because this is When you started with them, this is like big investment and kind of a large commitment in your mind about, hey, we're going to start automating stuff. We don't really know what it is, but we're going to automate it. Uh, When you started off with that, can you kind of tell us about your first few months with this idea of automation going on? So 
Getting back again to our friend Dean Jackson, you know, he talks about the before unit, the during unit, and the after unit. You were just talking about automation in the marketing versus or automation in the marketing versus the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. uh, you can spot it many different ways, but I was convinced that I could not only use Infusionsoft, which is a CRM, um, mostly designed for sales, that I could use it not only for sales for the the lawyer the law firm, but also that we could build the fulfillment on there. And I banged my head on the wall for a long time for like workflows and things. And eventually Kelsey and I just said, this is just not working. And this was after like two or three years. So right. um, I was pretty stubborn, but um, now we switch to other software that's built for law firms. And I mean, if, if, so I, I, I mentioned earlier, I think before we got on the call that I have a bunch of kids and you know, I was thinking about this. I, when my kids are 15 or 14, I can drive them everywhere they need to go. And if I never take the time to teach them how to drive, they'll be dependent on me and I'll have to keep driving them until they're 30 or 40, right? But if I take 10 weekends in a row and spend two hours with them each day and I build that system in their, in their ability and their capability, to drive themselves where they need to go, then I'm off the hook. So I'm always looking for ways, and I'm always encouraging my firm members to look for ways to automate it. You know, I'm also big on delegation. I, I Right now, our firm has grown from two people to 16 or 17. We have four lawyers, and that's because I didn't want to be doing all the cases. I don't like doing the cases. I, I, I'm good at handling cases. Just like I'm sure many of your listeners are good at being a doctor of chiropractic. But at the end of the day, if you want to scale and if you want freedom, which I think is why a lot of people open up a firm, you've got to spend the time to do that legwork in the during unit, in the fulfillment unit, to make sure that things are smooth and fast. And that's the only way you're going to scale. Otherwise, you're just going to be wasting all your time on three or four cases a day and driving yourself crazy. So, uh, you know, it's funny as you're talking about that. I'm like, it's not just that your kid can drive himself. It's that he can now throw one or two more kids in the car and take them to soccer practice or them to, you know, wherever they need to go. So it's a magnification. It's a it's, it's leverage. It's yeah. yeah, it's leverage. I like it. Hey, I want to tell you all about Membrant. Membrant with a D in there like Rembrandt. Membrant is an app platform. Now this company is the one who built the Clinic Gym Hybrid app. And if you uh, purchase our accelerator program, you will get firsthand knowledge of what they do. But I think this is the next evolution in clinics who want to really give their patients better care, better service while making it more convenient. So what Membrant can do is help you design a custom app for your company. This isn't just like rebranding somebody else's. This is your app that lives on the app store and your patients can download. Now, what's the power of an app? Well, let's just say, for example, that you have a certain protocol that you want your low back pain patients to go for. So let's say you include the McGill Big Three, a little talk about repetitive motions and finding your kind of McKenzie protocol of reducing your, your pain through those repetitive asymptomatic movements. Well, you could tag the patients, meaning that you kind of put them on a list that says you want them to have access to the low back protocols, right? And then you could have another program of videos, articles, exercise descriptions, all that, that only go out to your patients with shoulder pain, right? Or ones that go out to patients with plantar fasciitis. If you can build that program, then what Membrane can help you do is make sure that only the patients that really need the plantar fasciitis exercises get that delivered to their phone. That thing that they're staring at, some estimates say as many as 500 times a day, all right? So check out membrant.com, membrant.com, or send me an email, I can hook you up with those guys and they can put together a fantastic program. I think it's really the future and it's one more way that technology will help you make more money while providing better care and a better business model. So check out membrant.com. So what are some, I know that you're a big fan of Zapier and you guys had this amazing, uh, conference called the Zapathon that was like an amazing confluence of attorneys that basically know their business and um, they know the legal aspects and how to process a case. But also there was a lot of like, I have no idea how to connect these things or how to connect this process or how to reduce workload. 
one thing I remember just for people listening was one person said every day we get all these calls into our firm. I think they were like a personal injury firm. So they're getting a lot of call volume, right? We get these calls every day and it takes my, <laughs> it takes our secretary like four hours a day to transcribe those people and enter them into our, in, into our system. And it'd be great if we could reduce that to like an hour. And Kelsey being the brainiac that he is, he goes, well, what if it like auto-populated them in your system when they called? And, and I remember the woman going, you could do that. Like, it was like, it was like bringing a light bulb into the jungle, you know, like, right. what, what is this thing? What is this black magic you speak of? And he's like, yeah, I, I don't want your person transcribing or typing or doing any sort of manual entry. Like, let's just head it off at the pass. And for her, she's like, this literally will, I mean, I can't remember. You remember what she said? It was going to save us like 25 hours a week of paid yeah. work. It was 20. Yeah, she was, she was, that's Jesse Chappelle. She was the last person to sign up for the Zapathon and she was the happiest. And it was all because of that one thing. And right. so, yeah, that was insane. Yeah. Can you think of other processes your people have done or, or shared that, uh, that have made significant reduction of work? Because I just think like, gosh, you're paying that person, let's say it's 15 bucks an hour. That's $300 a week of work for, for something that can be automated and, and more accurate, by the way. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's what has surprised me with all the work that Kelsey and I have done on automation is, yeah, it's great to make things more efficient, but to squeeze, squeeze out errors is equally as important, especially, if, you know, you're doing important things, I'm doing important things, you don't want to be making a mistake. So if you, can, if you can systematize it so as to avoid errors or cut down on errors, that's a whole other added bonus. So um, for us, I think that getting the data from the sales team to the to the fulfillment team has been huge. Getting things, uh, calendaring, um, setting up consults, all that stuff. We use we use acuity scheduling so that people can have access to the lawyer schedule. Um, we don't do a lot by email. We're all on Slack now. I mean, let, let's let's change it up a little bit. I know you have a lot of things you want to talk about, but. Talk to me about the people in your group and what kind of resistance are you getting on these kinds of things that we're talking about? I'd be interested to hear that because I could sit here all day and have fun sitting up, thinking up ways for your group to improve things. So what, what are they struggling with or what do they fight you on? Yeah, well, you know, uh, we don't really have that contentious of a relationship, Jim, so they're not fighting me. But um, in all seriousness, you know, uh, I, would, I would say that the most common thing I hear is if you know, chiropractor saying, if I didn't have to do notes, that'd be the easiest thing ever, right? And so some people are using like manual solutions that like they hire an assistant to a scribe to just walk in every visit with them and track as the as it goes. And that equals, you know, have an extra hour of patients a day and that equals X amount of revenue. So it works, works well. Sometimes we use EMRs, electronic medical records. And I will say the frustration I've always, always had is in EMRs, you know, they're, all that information's HIPAA protected but what it ends up happening is a lot of the CRMs and, and uh, marketing automation softwares treat that as a brick wall, not as a gate where you have to ask permission. And they're just like, oh, you can't access any data. So like you have to manually double entry. If I want to send them hacking a birthday card every year and, and I want an automation to run to say like, hey, Jim, it's your birthday. Here's a card we all signed. That information, that birthday can't come out of the EMR. I have to enter it into my CRM as a separate event, right? That's just one thing where I'm like, that, that requires double entry for a stupid reason, right? Now, if I go, Jim, is it okay if I share your information or can I use your information to send you a birthday card? Most people go, that's fine. I, I love birthday cards, you know? So that's, that's part of it. And then I think the management of these records and thinking about like, you're saying the before, dur before unit, during unit, and after unit. One of the issues that I foresee is that our EMRs, our electronic medical records, are really just a during unit, um, what do you call it? Uh, repository, yeah. right? They show me what's happening while during fulfillment, but they don't follow up with that person and they don't work well on the front end uh, to get people in. And so I think going from the marketing side to the during unit is one thing that I'm working on solving, right? And so I think, let's say that I want to collect reviews for my practice, right? I want to get five-star reviews. 
uh, if I wanted to get five star reviews or as many reviews as I can, my gut instinct tells me don't email that request. Uh, I don't know what you're thinking, but I'm thinking don't email that request. That's probably like a more personal relationship, like a text message, like, hey, Jim, would you review us? Click here. Well, that's going to be tough if I, I have to double enter that person, pull them, their info out of the EMR and into the CRM, which now for people who don't have a CRM, like we're using all these three letter designations to confuse things, right? But in that case, how would you handle that looking from your perspective? I just want to send a, re a review text uh, and, you know, because I want to get more reviews and the best way to do that is to automate it, right? That doesn't seem like a, a tough thing. So when somebody calls your office and gives you their name, rank, and serial number, their name, their address, and their cell phone, does that go into the EMR or does that go into the CRM? It's a great question. M many of the people listening, it goes into their EMR. Yeah, that's Because wrong. they probably have better than 90% expectation that they'll show up and therefore become a patient. But I think you're, you're bringing up a good point. Yeah, no, no, no. You were not, you're, if, if, <clears throat> if some data becomes locked up in the EMR, you've got to figure out, and, and I would imagine that, like you say, it's hard to get the data out of the EMR into the stuff that you can use for marketing. Yeah. But I bet it's not as hard to get it from the marketing into the EMR. So what, I, what we use is pipe drive, but we, you could start with constant contact or something really basic. Something, and Autopilot HQ is another one that Kelsey really likes. Where you're, that data, until they become a client, they don't go in the EMR. Mm -hmm. So, and then anybody who's in the EMR, by definition, has to have been in the sales software, whatever that yeah. is. So yeah. get it in there, and then then you you got to figure out a way. It might be manual that when someone's done with treatment, you um, you put a tag on them in the sales software, and then you figure out whatever campaign you could totally do. Texting is easy. That's mm -hmm. a no-brainer. You just set up a, a uniform text with a link to your landing page for your Google reviews. Mm -hmm. um, I think you've got you've got to own the data, and you got to own it in a way that's flexible for you. So I'd be very I'd be very um, proprietary about it, and I would be like almost guard it jealously. Like I'm going to hold it in the sales software unless and until I have to put it into the EMR. The EMR is not my friend when it comes to marketing. Right. The MR right. is the black box where this stuff is held. I yeah. want to make sure that I kept, it's almost like you're in a fight with yourself, right? Well, it, it reminds me of like, uh, as a small business owner, I have all this money in my I'm in a separate savings account that will be used for taxes. But once I send it for taxes, the chance of me getting it back, if there's any argument or dispute, is as close to the definition of absolute zero as we can get, right? Like, yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is, yeah, keep it in the savings account and only send it when you're absolutely sure that you need to send it for taxes. So in the world of sales software, they're not a patient, and therefore they're not, that information is not protected until they come in the office, I examine them and render a diagnosis. Then we have a medical relationship, and at that point I need to transfer over. But I think you're right, getting it from any software, even a Google Sheet, into the EMR would be fairly easy at that point, but breaking it free is a whole lot harder. Yeah, so capture it first in one place so you always have it, and then you can use it for your before and after unit. And, of course, if our friend Tyson were here, he'd be saying, also, don't forget marketing to them while they're your client. So, mm -hmm. you know, just sending them little notes or things, mm -hmm. you could really trick it out. Um, I think it's, a, you know, we have a – because we see people multiple times in a week for their condition, mm -hmm. you're, you're getting those impulses, whereas Tyson's probably months between contacts, right? They come from initial console, but it's, it's not a bad idea. Um, Let me ask you a question. Let yeah. me ask you a question. Think I of like this, Jim. I, I schedule you for an interview and you're like, oh, well, you did, what huh? I do. I'm going to switch your This is the Indiana Jones switching out the golden skull here. Think of the last 30 people that you've consulted with. Yeah. How many of them do you think went to a chiropractor before? You're saying my clients or you're saying chiropractors have your been? Your clients. Your Josh clients that have been to a chiropractor before? Yeah. Mm, I would guess about 75% of them. And how many of them do you think remember the name of that chiropractor? Uh, less than that, somewhere between 25 to 50%, maybe. If you, if you were, if you were to find out, like if, if, if we held a parade in front of your office <laughs> and we had every client who used to be your patient, who's now treating with somebody else, you'd like, you'd want to like set yourself on fire, wouldn't you? Yeah. 
So think about that. I mean, the, that's the value of the after unit. If you're not yeah. maintaining a relationship with them after they leave, I mean, the, the, every other chiropractor is seeing those same percentages. They're seeing 75% of the people that came to see them had a chiropractor in the past. I mean, for us as lawyers, it's like if I go down to immigration and I help someone get their green card and I see him with some other lawyer getting his citizenship, I'm pissed. But I'm not pissed at him and I'm not pissed at the lawyer. I'm pissed at me. That's yeah. on me. That when you when you have them in your during unit, you've got to love on them so that they would never think of stepping out on you. They would only come back to you, Josh. So how do you, how are some, what are some methods for loving on them in the during unit? So throughout throughout, as soon as they enter your before unit until the day that they're gone. Now in the before unit, I think you should have little sequences: one for back pain, one for headaches, one for not being able to sleep. So if someone calls your office. You know, a fair number of people who call your office aren't going to come see you right away. I don't know what that percentage is, but there's a percentage. And everyone thinks, I just got to get them in now. I got to get them in now. But you also need to think about that long-term relationship. So as soon as they come in, you give them a little sequence for the kind of pain that they're in. And then once they become a client, they go on your weekly email. So you should have a weekly flagship email Mm -hmm. that isn't, here's me, Dr. Josh, I'm so cool. No, it's like, here's something cool that happened at the gym. Let me tell you about Annabelle. Annabelle is one of our trainers. She works with a lot of our clients and she helped this guy get ready for his first marathon. And then here's a client success story. This guy came over to see us. He was all hunched over. His neck was out of whack and I adjusted him for eight weeks and now he loves us. And then you have a video of him with you, thumbs up, smiley face. And then you're the, you're the guide. You're, you're guiding your clients to health. And you're telling these stories in an interesting way. It can't just be boring ass. Oh, I'm Josh, Dr. Josh. Let me tell you how great I am. I've been a chiropractor for 17 years. Nobody cares. So have an interesting newsletter that people would actually want to read. You can tell stories about your kids. You can tell about you went to the Cardinal game or the, or the, the Golden Knights match or whatever. And just do it like that. Make it an interesting thing. So that's a weekly email. And then you figure out a way. You know, like, to, you know, if you refer us a client, the next time you come in for adjustment, we'll do it for half off or whatever. You know, there's lots mm-hmm. you can do in the before unit, the during unit, and the after unit. But most of those people who aren't coming back to you, it's because they forgot who you are. Yeah. I think you're, yeah, you're really making my wheel spin here, Jim. So what you're saying is have a, a set of, of campaigns running for people who call your office and hem haw and blah, blah, blah. And you can say, okay, well, I'll just send you these, this video all about back pain or headaches. Some of those people are going to convert into now coming into your office, right? And you're also saying that when people are in your office, these people are that, hey, I'm paying you money. I'm coming in every week. It seems like we have a perfect relationship, right? Yeah. But uh, you're saying, no, 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 no. Like, you got to crank this up. You got to send them emails specific to their conditions. Send them messages and send them success stories of these people so they feel reassured that what is going on is the right thing. So in your world, this is somebody's coming in for a green card, you're sending them success stories of other people that got their green card. So they're not getting desperate in this search, right? They're not thinking, oh man, I should go somewhere else. I I haven't heard from these guys. She's saying, no, no, I'm going to stay in touch with you. And I'm going to show you that we've done this a hundred times for other people. One of my videos. One of my videos was about a guy who'd been waiting a really long time for his wife to come on, a, or no, waiting for his citizenship. And I've I've had that case thirty different times. So I put them all into one amalgam of a person that I called Muhammad. Muhammad's been waiting for three years for a citizenship case. That's not fair. We sued USCIS and we got Muhammad his citizenship within sixty days. Now, when people call our office, they go, hey, that's me. My case is just like Muhammad's, right? So, <laughs> yeah. So, when you tell those client success stories, that, that goes 10 times better than you talking about how great you are. Having other people talk about how great you are is a real thing. That's awesome. Well, if there was one system you think that uh, some people can look at, uh, it sounds like you're saying go after that marketing system in the office. So, people are reassured to do that. And then don't lose sight of them when they move to the during, or sorry, the after unit in your before, during, and after unit kind of organization. Yeah, and let's talk about dead leads, okay? So hopefully your listeners are keeping track of everybody who calls. Hopefully that they have a list of everybody. I, I, I got to stop you now and request one thing here, Jim. 25 to 33% of my Facebook group say, oh no, 
You can't say leads and sales. You can't treat people like that. This is healthcare. You have to care about people. They're, they're not customers. They're, they're patients. And, and my, my thought is go volunteer at a, at a nonprofit thing, but don't turn your own practice into a nonprofit scenario. <laughs> you need to have profit to be able to keep the doors open long-term. So uh, it, if you want to address that, I'd, I'd love it because you're working with people that need help, right? They need to stay here to pr- keep their family fed and whatnot. And yet you're treating your office like a business. So do you have any words of wisdom? I'd love it. You spent all this time and all this money to get your DC. You believe, I hope, that you're the best chiropractor in town. If you don't believe you're the best chiropractor in town, there's something wrong. And you need to do something to make sure that you feel that you're the best chiropractor in town. And if you are the best chiropractor in town, then it is a moral obligation for you to help as many people as possible. So you can quibble over the sanctity of chiropractic. Just like we have these lawyers who say lawyers should not be advertising or keeping people as treating people as leads. That's mm-hmm. fine. You don't have to call them leads. Call them potential patients, prospects, whatever you want to, however you want to phrase it. At the end of the day, we're all people in arriving in pain. We're all yeah. We're all in sales. Daniel Pink said it best. Yeah. Everybody is selling. We're all selling. And if you think you're the best, you have a moral obligation to heal as many people as you can. And you can only do that if you have an effective before unit, an effective sales unit. I hate to say it. You can call it whatever you want, Mm -hmm. but you've got to optimize the people who have contacted you. So getting back to my point, hopefully, and I I do this at conferences or at times I give talks to just regular lawyers. I say, if I were to ask you how many people in this room, how many law firm owners could tell me within 20 minutes the name, address, email address, and cell phone number of the last 200 people that have called your office. When I ask law firm owners to do that, I would say 10% can pull that off. That's mind boggling to me. Now you're saying not people that have scheduled, you're saying just called, just every time the phone rings with a person that may need the legal services on the other end. You gotta capture capture all their contact information because you never know when they're gonna need you and they might just have a random question right now. So to say anything to anybody at our firm, you have to give your name, your email address, and your cell phone, the mailing address we get later. But those are the three requisites to continue talking on the phone with us. And we record each and every one of those. And so hopefully your members have been doing that. If not, they should start that today with, as you said, a Google Sheet until they get a CRM. Now I'm sure 99% of them are doing it. Let's just okay. talk to the one guy who might have forgot. Good. How would so, you start this process? So, so hopefully they've done that. Now, it, they, and, 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 you know, I always like to talk, Josh, let's say that you have Yellow Pages ads or websites or you're doing click, pay-per-click, whatever. Let's say that you're spending $2,500 a month to make the phone ring. And let's just say you're really good and 50 people call your office a month. Mm-hmm. Or let's say, 200, let's say 250 people. That makes it even easier. So you're spending 2,500 and 250 people are calling your office. So that mm-hmm. means it costs you $10 to make the phone ring. And then if half of those are becoming clients or patients, then it costs you $20, right? Right. So you have to do that math. You have to know those numbers. Because if you can figure out, I can make the phone ring, for uh, $20 or $10 and I can get a client for 20, well then you'd be willing to spend 10 or $15 to make, if, if I told you, give me $10 and I'll give you 20, you would do that all day long. Be giving you then marketing doesn't could, become yeah. an expense, it becomes an investment. Mm-hmm. So your listeners have to know their numbers, but if they have been capturing those people and if those people did not turn into leads, you need to follow up with them and, and the best way to do it is the amazing nine word email that revives dead leads. You know about that? The n- amazing nine word email that revives dead leads. Is this a, another Dean Jackson, Dac, Dean Jackson gem? It is. Yeah. And it's a very simple email. Jim, are you still looking for help with your bad back? Josh. 
no marketing, no, uh, there's no template to this. There's no, no branding. Color. This is a plain text email. Or it, it could be a text message or an email, plain text email for sure. No logo, yeah. no picture of the office in the background. This isn't in 48 size font and a, you know, blue color. Or like in the old days, like on MySpace with all the flashing lights and the yeah. and everything. No, it's just, it's as if Dean would call it a short personal expecting a reply email. Uh, so just a short email where it seems like Josh is talking to Jim and that, that email is going to be almost irresistible. Hmm. I wonder why Josh is asking. Maybe he has a new treatment for me, or maybe there's some new thing about back pain that I don't know about. And, and you'll, if, if, if your listeners go to that list of the last 200 people and send it, I guarantee you the open rate will be, or the, the open rate will be about 40%. And they'll get tons of replies. They will get business right out of just by sending that email to those 200 people. Wow. Now, just out of curiosity, Jim, so you guys track every call that comes in. How many calls do you get every week versus how many actual new clients do you get every week? Four to yeah, one so, ratio, two to one ratio? Oh, no, no. Right now we get, uh, we get about 170 calls a week and we get about 15 cases a week. That 10% roughly? Yeah. Okay. So you're getting a lot of calls and that list is growing way faster than your paid client list is, but you're saying do this. I mean, you'll a hundred and you'll get that 250 in, in nine days worth of, of work. Right. Yeah. 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 That's, that's interesting. True. I mean, that's, that's only 12. I mean, if you if we do the math here, you're saying 250 people for $2,500 worth of marketing. I think that equals out to like 12 and a half people a day calling the office. One and a half, that's going to give us 60, a little more than 60, 125. Yeah, you're going to get 250 people a month if you are open five days doing that. So you're talking about a month worth of calls and all you have to do is track them and then send this little campaign to them. Hey, yeah. I'm still interested it's, in your the, back pain. It's the last email we send to someone who hasn't hired us. So we have a little sequence, then we wait three weeks and then it automatically sends them that nine word email. Wow. So that's just... Uh, digging into their little curiosity mechanism and squeezing that grape and saying, Hey, you, you probably want to re-pursue this or now yeah. if they've already hired somebody, no big deal. Right. But it, it, it would cost you, you know, one tenth of a penny to send them that email. Right. And so, yeah. you know, keeping it. track of who hires you and who doesn't. And then, you know, eventually if you get busy enough and get enough volume, then it might be worth hiring a college kid to follow up with the lead. Yeah. And you know, and I know, I mean, these, the, the ability for somebody to follow up, send a text message, send an email, send a picture is so much greater now. I mean, it's literally a few clicks a of a joke. button a joke. that it could be so efficient. Yep. Yeah. Wow. All right. Well, Jim, I know we're up against the clock. I really appreciate your time. Um, if people want to kind of understand more about what you're about, uh, I mean, a bunch of chiropractors and physical therapists listening, you mind if they check out the, the, the Facebook group or, Maximum yeah. Lawyer Podcast? For sure, they should check out the podcast. They can always email me, jim at maximumlawyer.com or jim at hackinglawpractice.com. Always happy to hop on a call or to give people ideas and things. Um, yeah, we'd be happy to help any way we can. Yeah, I mean, we covered so much here, Jim, from the 100 videos and 100 days challenge on the front end to the, what to do with dead leads and what to do internally. I think this is fantastic. So, Jim, uh, congratulations to you for those listeners. Jim's wearing a San Diego hat because he's opening a second practice in San Diego, One day. which is a little bit nicer in the winter than St. Louis. But, uh, but man, I'm excited for you and for your kids Thanks, to move man. down there too. Thanks. And you know, the other thing they should check out is you were on our show, so they should check out that episode. Yeah, that's true. I was. I can't. I can't tell you, Jim, how blown away I was when I was at that event and saw the way that those attorneys were thinking about the future of law. I mean. Half of them don't even have offices. They're all totally virtual. And like, you don't answer your own phones. Your crew doesn't answer your own phones, right? You use a service. It's just such a different thought. So I'm so glad I was exposed to you and so glad that I, I get to listen to you guys on your podcast. And uh, you guys are doing impressive things in many ways. So on behalf of Jim Hacking, this is Josh Satterley saying, go out there, maximize your license and live the life you dream of. Thanks a lot, Jim. You're welcome, buddy. Take care. Thanks so much for checking out these videos. I hope they're useful. We'll cover things like rehab, exercise, business model, progressions, layout, everything else that helps you build a clinic. So if you're interested, you can click here, there, here, here, or anywhere 
to get more videos just like this. Thanks a lot for watching and we'll see you soon.